assessing the impact of the financial action task force on financial inclusion according to a very recent study the proportion of unbanked population in asia is around 24% and this number probably neglects the significant underbanked population in the region as well financial exclusion imposes a huge cost on economic growth and development unfortunately so does financial crime and inadvertently a tightening of the anti financial crime regime over the years led to de-risking and exclusion of the poor from formal financial systems as this unintended con con consequence came to the fore the fatf took note via formal recognition of uh, financial exclusion as an mltf risk in 2012 and the introduction of the risk based approach that advised proportionality in aml safety measures this guidance has been periodically updated over the years and it is now believed that financial inclusion and the implementation of aml cft standards can be mutually supportive and have complementary objectives and that enabling a wider population with access to financial services will in fact increase the reach and effectiveness of aml cft measures the covid-19 pandemic has further underscored the importance of reaching unbanked populations and the massive opportunity presented by digital financial services in inclusive growth Today we are here to understand the conclusions of important research carried out by the Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies at RUSI, which uh, has been done over the last couple of years and funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It will help us understand where the efforts at promoting financial inclusion stand and whether the risk-based approach has, in fact, achieved what it set out to accomplish. The session today will highlight. the impacts of the fatf framework on financial inclusion and five recommendations for how fatf could better promote and protect financial inclusion in the future we have two esteemed speakers with us today f christopher kalabia senior advisor supervisory and regulatory policy at the bill and melinda gates foundation and isabella chase research fellow at the center for financial crime and security studies rusi welcome chris and isabella and thank you so much for joining us live despite the time difference especially chris uh, i think it's you know the b hours of the morning for you and i'm sure by the end of this webinar we have probably succeeded in wrecking your sleep pattern at least for the next couple of days thanks so much for having us thank you so we will first have opening remarks by chris uh, that will be followed by a detailed presentation by isabella uh, as usual we will have a q and a session at the end of the presentation so i request all participants to kindly post their questions in the Q&A window and not in the chat window uh, before i invite chris for his opening remarks let me introduce him to all of you as i mentioned earlier chris is currently senior advisor supervisory and regulatory policy at the bill and melinda gates foundation and is based in the usa he has had a stellar career having worked earlier with organizations such as the federal reserve bank of new york the international monetary fund and the bank for international settlements he is widely acknowledged as being a visionary leader for strategic change has created compelling roadmaps for innovation in complex environments led the development of the post financial crisis supervisory strategy at a globally systemic uh, global systemically important firm and built consensus on, on the regulatory agenda across global supervisory agencies chris encourages openness to new technologies and service providers in emerging markets and developing countries with that chris over to you thank you sharish and thank you to isabel as well i'm honored to join both of you today for this important discussion of work that our colleagues at rusi have led looking at the intersection of financial inclusion and anti money laundering so at the gates foundation uh, we believe that every person deserves the chance to lead a healthy and productive life and we seek to address inequities that could create barriers to achieving that vision such as inequities in healthcare education and economic empowerment especially for women and girls and there's a growing body of research that suggests that when people who live in extreme poverty have access 
to appropriate digital financial tools, that they're actually better able to lift themselves and their families out of poverty and to do so sustainably. And so we encourage policymakers and regulators to support regulatory policies that will expand access to and the use of especially digital financial services among people who have traditionally been left out by the formal financial system, such as underserved women, the poor, or the unbanked. And we believe strongly that financial systems and financial service providers should be well regulated and that they should uh, promote the protection of consumers against harm, as well as achieve very important public policy goals, such as financial stability, financial inclusion, as well as financial integrity. Now, I think the question might be why we're really interested in anti-money laundering issues. And one reason is that we think that when economies are better protected against uh, abuses such as money laundering and the financing of terrorism, financial institutions are more likely to have a greater confidence in their ability to bank people who were previously unbanked or underbanked or to accept consumers and and uh, people who might have been viewed as higher risks uh, of these types of challenges or potentially be considered potential victims themselves of financial crimes. And so one of the most important standards that we often talk about in financial inclusion includes uh, the ability to onboard new types of consumers who haven't had financial services before, especially those who are unbanked or maybe living in poverty. And one challenge for many of them in some low and middle income countries is that people who are, live in extreme poverty may lack access to the traditional types of identity documentation that you and I might be familiar with. So things like driver's licenses or passports or even birth certificates. And so as a result, in, in the past, it's been very difficult for these people to open accounts because most countries have requirements that people be able to prove who they are to the authorities or to private uh, providers in order to open up something like a financial services account or even to buy a mobile phone or a SIM card. And so Isabella and our colleagues at RUSI have looked really closely at these and other global standards that may have unintended consequences on people who are traditionally left out of the financial system and thinking about how we can still ensure compl greater compliance with these global standards and promote this important public policy goal of inclusion. So that's one reason that we sponsored this, this research. Another reason is that we wanted to have a better evidence base available from this research so that it would be easier for us to understand what types of policies can help the poor to gain access to financial services and participate in the more formal uh, economy. And so that regulators and center setting bodies and other donors and those who advocate for financial inclusion and international development would have a, gre a greater knowledge of these challenges and understanding. And so our goal is to ensure that people are not excluded inadvertently from the financial system and that they're able to gain access to these important digital financial services tools so that they can invest in their futures, save for their futures and ensure a better life for themselves and their children. And so that's why we got involved with this work. And I'll turn it back to you, Shiresh, and to my colleague, uh, Isabella. Thanks, thanks, Chris, uh, for your message. Um, let me now invite uh, Isabella Chase uh, to make her presentation. But before that, uh, a few words about her. Um, Isabella is a research fellow at the Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies at RUSI, based in London. Her work focuses on government policy responses to financial crime. In addition to leading a two-year project, uh, which assesses the impact of the FATF framework on digital financial inclusion, she also researches the UK government's implementation of the 2019 Economic Crime Plan and monitors the FAT of strategic review and AML reforms in the EU. Her other research interests include new payment technologies, e-money, sanctions, and financial crime involving high value goods such as art. Isabella holds an MA in intelligence and international security with distinction from the War Studies Department at King's College London. Isabella, maybe have your presentation now, please. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining today for my presentation. I will just share my slides, so just bear with me for a moment. I hope you can all see that. Uh, well, yeah, so that, like I say, thank you so much for joining uh, today to hear more about our research on assessing the impact of FATF on financial inclusion. And of course, I just extend huge thanks to Chris and the Gates Foundation for so kindly sponsoring and supporting this research throughout. It's, it's been a really uh, collaborative project and we really enjoyed 
working together. So I'm here to tell you about our two papers uh, that we released last week. And these are the product of our research, which we started back in January 2020. Uh, you'll see the, the dark, the striking dark purple paper here is our occasional paper, which takes a look back at the impact of FATAF on digital financial inclusion to date. And our second paper, the yellow and white, is a much shorter policy brief, which makes five recommendations for how FATAF can better protect and promote financial inclusion going forward. Uh, so just to say before I dive into our findings and, and the research more generally, if you have any questions throughout, please do feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Um, and I'll do my best to sort of monitor it as I go and, and answer them uh, if they're sort of appropriate at the time. But if not, I'm sure we'll have plenty of time at the end to go into them. And also, uh, if you have any just general comments on specific findings or recommendations, which might not be questions, uh, just some feedback, please also do add that because we're really keen um, at this stage to gather the feedback of compliance professionals such as yourself on what we found. So before I dive into our findings and sort of building a bit off what Chris was saying just then, um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about why we decided at RUSI to do this research. And it really for us starts with the FATAF permanent mandate, which was granted to the organization in June of 2019. And with the granting of the permanent mandate, FATAF issued a document which contains the statement that you can see here. The FATAF will continue to promote financial inclusion and encourage proportionate and effective implementation of the FATAF standards by countries in line with the risk-based approach. Now, when myself and my research director came across this statement, we thought, wow, that's, that's really interesting. We're aware of a, a number of activities that FATAF does to promote financial inclusion, but is there parts that maybe we're not that familiar with? And if people like us who, as you might know, spend our days and weeks down in the weeds of the FATAF standards and trying to understand financial crime uh, regulation and policy, how would other stakeholders in the FATF ecosystem really understand uh, the work that FATF does to promote financial inclusion? So we set out to really better understand this relationship between FATF and financial inclusion. And we asked our sort of overarching research question, which was to what extent has FATF impacted digital financial inclusion? And you'll notice that emphasis on digital, as Chris said previously, you know, really for the Gates Foundation, but also for us, uh, we really recognize the power of digital channels to empower the unbanked and the underbanked uh, to gain access to finance. So for us, it was really important to consider those digital channels. We then also wanted to better understand how different elements of the FATAF framework uh, impact digital financial inclusion. So for us, that's the standards, the mutual evaluation process, the listing procedures and the governance structure. And we also wanted to understand how countries undergoing a mutual evaluation prioritize and perceive financial inclusion whilst they're going through that process. So a lot of the research to date has looked at how the mutual evaluation reports impact financial inclusion, how they comment on it and, and the negative impacts they can have. But there is less work done on the stages prior to report being published and on how those can impact financial inclusion. So that was something we really wanted to better understand. Finally, we also wanted to understand the extent to which the FATF system is compatible with those digital tools that are really essential for digital financial inclusion, such as tools that enable uh, EKYC or uh, the use of digital identities, new payment technologies, such as mobile money. So how did we go about answering these questions? Well, uh, we did what all sort of re uh, research think tanks do, and we started with an extensive literature review. Uh, we then conducted three case studies in Tanzania, Pakistan, and Indonesia. And we selected these case study countries uh, for two main reasons. First of all, they're all focus countries for the Financial Services for the Poor program, which is a program run by the Gates Foundation. 
And second of all, they've all recently undergone or are undergoing some form of fat activity. So Tanzania had a SMLAG mutual evaluation in June 2019 and is awaiting its mutual evaluation report. Pakistan is grey listed, uh, but of course has had a, a relatively recent mutual evaluation. And Indonesia was evaluated in 2018, but is currently seeking membership to what I like to call cool FATF or big FATF, and so is awaiting a uh, FATF mutual evaluation itself. In total for this research, we conducted 90 interviews, and I will emphasize the fact that these were virtual interviews. Uh, of course, as I said earlier, we started this research in January 2020. So by the time we got to our uh, interview stage, the majority of the world, unfortunately, was in some form of coronavirus lockdown, and it was impossible for us to chat to travel. So this was, I suppose, Rusi's first ever totally virtual project, um, which I think had many benefits. I had a couple of drawbacks as well, but uh, it's, I think that's quite important to bear in mind uh, when considering our findings. Finally, uh, we took our findings from those interviews and we held a expert working group to validate our findings, which was observed by the FATF Secretariat. So what did we actually find? Well, overall, we found that the FATF framework does have some negative impacts on financial inclusion, but that overall, this impact, this negative impact, tends to be inadvertent. And it occurs despite the fact that there are tools and provisions in place that can support financial inclusion. The problem being that these tools or provisions might not be used, or if they are used, they might be misinterpreted or poorly implemented. So going, to, going into the detail of like, what does this actually mean in practice, we break our findings down, and this is in our, the big purple paper that I showed earlier, we break our findings down by the different elements of the FATF framework that we investigated. So beginning with the standards, what we found is that the FATF standards, so this is the 40 recommendations, interpretive notes, we include the guidance documents here as well. Uh, so what we found is that the FATF standards very much afford the necessary provisions and flexibility to support financial inclusion. What do we mean by this? Well. Flexibility is very much afforded by the standards because we have the risk-based approach and the provisions to assist financial inclusion exist through simplified due diligence. However, there's a lot of assumption we feel in the fact of standards around countries being able to implement the risk-based approach. As I'm sure you all know, being able to use a risk-based approach in an effective way is really reliant on being able to carry out an accurate national or business risk assessment. And for countries which might have lower capacity or different pressures, they may find it really difficult to carry out an a national risk assessment exercise that truly reflects the financial landscape and the financial inclusion landscape that they see in a country. Of course, without a really accurate national risk assessment, it becomes very difficult to proportionately uh, implement the risk-based approach. And what you tend to see here as being the biggest sort of victim within that is the use of simplified due diligence. Of course, this then brings in an issue of incentives because, as we all know in the FATF standards, enhanced due diligence is mandatory in high risk uh, scenarios. But using simplified due diligence in low risk scenarios is not mandatory. And so, if you already are not quite sure what your risks look like, you're unlikely to have the confidence to employ simplified due diligence, which is so important for uh, enabling financial inclusion at the lower end of the risk spectrum. We'd also argue that within the FATF standards, we see much less detail on how to apply uh, simplified due diligence than we see with enhanced due diligence. And this is looking really at that interpretive note to recommendations one and 10. In addition, it was felt by our interviewees uh, that some of the guidance, so specifically the 2017 guidance document on simplified due diligence, is a bit out of date and difficult to use in today's payment landscape. And this actually brings us on to a really important side note on the FATF guidance documents. Now, as I'm sure we all know, it, it's sort of crazy how few of these are translated out of English, 
which of course makes them really exclusive to non-English speaking populations. We also know that the majority of FATF guidance documents are drafted by those core FATF member states, and so might not reflect the experiences of countries in the global south or countries that are developing. And of course, it's often these countries that could benefit most from that extra detail that's provided by guidance documents, but might not be able to use them for these reasons. So that was our first finding on the standards. Moving on to the mutual evaluation process, what we found is that this process doesn't directly impact financial inclusion. Uh, sorry, it doesn't directly inhibit financial inclusion. But what really we see is a, a missed opportunity because what you can do with the mutual evaluation process is really use it as a chance to bolster the narrative that financial inclusion and the implementation of financial crime controls are mutually beneficial. And this is made worse by, and, and this is picked up in, in a couple of other research uh, projects in this area, is that you see very inconsistent treatment of the topic of financial inclusion across different mutual evaluations around the world. So what you'll see is uh, you'll tend to only really see financial inclusion considered by assessors if a country has a very large informal economy, or if uh, the risk of financial exclusion is increasing your terrorist financing risk, or if financial inclusion is a personal interest of one of the assessors, you'll see it more widely considered. But what we don't see is a really consistent, broad uh, approach to considering how financial inclusion is being impacted uh, during mutual evaluation processes, both on-site visits, and then also in mutual evaluation reports. What we also found in our research was that the assessors conducting mutual evaluations have quite an inconsistent understanding of what they should be looking for during mutual evaluations when it comes to financial inclusion and how financial inclusion initiatives can be balanced with financial crime objectives. Lastly, and complementing some really excellent research that uh, the World Bank has recently done, we found that mutual evaluation reports themselves, they aren't necessarily very complementary of uh, financial inclusion initiatives taken by countries. Uh, to borrow some of the research from the World Bank, it was found that uh, it is much more common for simplified due diligence or exemptions to be criticized in MERS than praised. And we feel this is a really missed opportunity to help countries and support them in trying to meet inclusive financial integrity objectives. So moving next to the ICRG process, uh, which is the group within FATF that produces the gray and black lists. Now, of course, this is a very contentious area. Uh, a lot of people will say, um, of course, gray lists are terrible for financial inclusion or they, you know, they really impact countries considerably. Uh, and what we found was when you really start to dig into the literature on this topic, there's very little hard data or evidence that will tell you exactly what the impacts of a grey listing or a blacklisting are on financial inclusion in a country. Of course, as we all know, there's plenty of anecdotal evidence and purely based off uh, what we heard in our interviews, we found three main areas in which the ICRG process impacts financial inclusion. First, we found a real considerable impact on national policymakers. So understandably, when a country is grey listed or blacklisted, there is a real sense of urgency in a country to do whatever it takes to remove a country from this list. And this whatever it takes might be uh, redirecting the resources of a civil service or policymakers or bringing in a huge amount of uh, new regulation or legislation very quickly. And what we found is that this can really disrupt financial inclusion initiatives in a country. Second of all, we see quite a considerable impact on investment in a country. And this seems to be especially bad for uh, the providers of digital financial services, who in our interviews uh, convey to us that FATF listings can make it much more difficult to attract foreign venture capital or just normal investment uh, into a country because of a grey listing. 
We also know it makes it becomes much more difficult for the World Bank or for the IMF to provide loans to a country when they are on a FATF grey list. Finally, uh, and very well documented, so I, I won't labour it, labor it too much. Uh, of course, our research supported previous studies that claim, and sorry, that state that FATF listings have considerable impacts on correspondent banking relationships, leading to often an increase in the cost of remittances or wide scale de-risking. I think one thing I'd really like to underline here though, is we really think for meaningful action to take place in the area of, of maybe minimizing the impacts of gray and black lists on financial inclusion, it is really essential that better data is produced to validate these impacts. And so we can really measure them over a long period of time. Finally, uh, well, in terms of our findings, the last area that we looked at within the FATF framework uh, that impacts financial inclusion, we looked at the FATF governance structure. And what we mean here is the FATF president and the FATF uh, and FSRB, FATF style regional body secretariats, as well as the very closely intertwined international bodies such as the World Bank, uh, who play really vital roles in setting the tone for how the FATF framework should be implemented. I mean, a term I think we're all really uh, familiar with is that culture of compliance. And we see that the FATF governance structure have a really important role to play in setting that culture. Unfortunately, what we found is that the treatment of financial inclusion by this governance structure has been a little inconsistent. And when you have that inconsistency, you make it less easy for stakeholders to understand that uh, financial inclusion and financial crime compliance are really mutually beneficial. And what I mean by that, and I'm sure you all, you all remember it well, is that we saw peaks of focus that are positive for this notion. So for example, between 2012 and early 2016, we see the bringing in of the new framework, we see a focus on effectiveness, we see the focus on uh, NPOs, for example, and trying to reverse a lot of that uh, de-risking that occurred in 2014. But after 2015, we see a real lull in activity. We see a refocus on things like terrorist financing, which was very understandable at the time following the Paris attacks. But it wasn't really then for another four years until 2019, when we see financial inclusion resurfacing in the mandate document, the German presidency, uh, priorities, and of course, in the very important new announcement of the Unintended Consequences Project, that we see financial inclusion back on the agenda again at FATF. We would argue it's really important that that focus on financial inclusion and building the idea that these two uh, frameworks can work together is really important and has to be done consistently. Finally, uh, just on the financial, sorry, the FATF style regional bodies, we found again their focus does vary, uh, on their focus on financial inclusion does vary, and this very much depends on the level of maturity of the FSRB. Of course, if it's a very new one, uh, it might be dealing with more foundational issues as a priority, which makes total sense. And then it would depend on the extent to which financial inclusion is an urgent priority in that region, how much it will be considered. So that summarizes the main findings of our project. Um, I will move on to our recommendations now, but I just want to check if anyone wanted to come in with a question or if there was any questions from Fintelect at this point. Um, I think Isabella, maybe best to take questions at the end. Uh, we do have uh, two or three questions, but let's take them at the end. No problem at all. Thanks. So moving on to our recommendations, and these really fill the second paper that I showed at the beginning. Um, so what we recommend, like how, how does FATA fix this problem? Well, we sort of uh, would argue, take a, take a leaf out of international best practices. Many countries around the world are creating their own national financial inclusion strategies. So why doesn't FATF do the same? Why not come up and devise its own financial inclusion strategy that could outlive a single presidency 
and allow the organization to put in place a number of actions over a sustained period of time to really try and mitigate any of those negative impacts that we've identified or the FATF uh, unintended consequences project uh, has also, I, well, will come to identify, I'm sure. We'll see. We have to wait for the outcome of their work. Um, so that would be our overarching recommendation. And of course, at RUSI, we always like to, to focus on practical recommendations. So we've come up with five, uh, sort of, I suppose a starter for five, if you, if, if, you, um, if you know what I mean, to get them going on what could be within this financial inclusion strategy. So first of all, uh, and I, I will warn you, we've been quite ambitious. So if they look quite uh, ambitious, it's, it's because they are. Um, to start with our first recommendation, we would call for FATF to update the recommendations to better promote compliance practices that enable financial inclusion. And here we would ask them to consider uh, recommendations one, 10 and two. In terms of recommendation one, that looks at the assessment of risk and the risk-based approach, we think it would be important to balance or rebalance the language between the use of simplified and enhanced measures to give entities greater confidence in using simplified due diligence. Whilst they're at it, we would also recommend uh, updating the guidance on simplified due diligence to incorporate some more up-to-date and contemporary examples that really reflect the payment landscape that we see today. Uh, building off that, we would also recommend an update to recommendation 10. And this is the recommendation that looks at customer due diligence. Now, in the interpretive note to recommendation 10, uh, in the list of examples for what is higher risk, remote verification is listed as a higher risk example. This uh, can really de-incentivize the use of remote verification techniques, which are really important for uh, fintech onboarding, as well as onboarding, onboarding rural populations, for example. Now, in 2020, uh, FATF released a guidance document on digital identity where they actually removed the notion of remote verification being always considered as higher risk. So we would just argue that they update recommendation 10 in the guidance so that it reflects that uh, non-binding guidance document. Finally, we would recommend uh, updating recommendation 2, which is a recommendation all about ensuring national coordination. And for us, we think it's important to include national authorities responsible for financial inclusion efforts in that, uh, that requirement for national coordination, because really building off work of groups such as the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, who really promote the idea um, that the more coordination you have across governments on financial crime and financial inclusion, the more likelihood you have of creating policies that are really robust at tackling crime but also don't have those unintended consequences. Our second recommendation would be to update the FATF methodology to incorporate a recognition of financial inclusion as contributing to a country's effectiveness. So we would suggest two initial steps. One, include um, a more consistent review of financial inclusion information during the scoping exercise. So this is the uh, first stage of a mutual evaluation report. And here, if you considered financial inclusion more, uh, then from the outset, it would be included within the mutual evaluation framework. Second, we think it's really important to increase the recognition in mutual evaluation reports of positive activities that countries take to try and promote financial inclusion. So for example, that could include taking uh, considerations of financial inclusion in the national risk assessment or progressive uses of simplified due diligence or exemptions in lower risk scenarios. But of course, as I said, to be ambitious, uh, we would say if, if FATF really wants to, um, to really forward its message on financial inclusion, why not include it in its effectiveness rating? And here we're looking specifically at immediate outcomes three and four, where we would argue that supervision can only really be consumer at to risk if uh, actions taken have no impact, well, sorry, uh, if actions taken have negative impacts and those are then mitigated against. Third, uh, we think it's really important if you were to update those first two, uh, what the standards and the, and the methodology, 
well, you'd have to give greater training to assessors so that they could better assess how countries are considering financial inclusion. And um, we would argue that you could make use of uh, the, like the new online tools that FATF has for training. And this would really allow for a more consistent uh, consideration of financial inclusion in assessments, which I think would be really important again for sort of setting that culture of compliance. Fourth, uh, we think it's really important to produce that data on how uh, financial inclusion is impacted by the FATF grey and black lists. And we would propose a three pronged approach for how to do this, but it's just a suggestion. Um, the first would be to, just as the FATF action plan is being drawn up, to take a really detailed review of a country's financial inclusion landscape so that you could consider how different action points within the plan would likely impact financial inclusion in the country. Second, um, we would ask FATF to better consider how the timeline for the completion of an action plan is likely to impact financial inclusion. Is there going to be a, so much pressure on a country that it will prioritise getting off the list, at, at, even if it's at the cost of financial inclusion objectives? And finally, once a listing is concluded, or in the case of a, a listing continuing for a number of years, we would call on FATF to conduct an impact assessment to understand how those actions in the plan and also the uh, actions brought in by countries to meet the plan have impacted financial inclusion. And then we would say it's really important to take those learnings from other countries, from their impact assessments, and feed those then into the initial scoping exercise uh, for newly listed countries so that action plans can really learn and iterate from previous plans uh, so that we hope as many negative impacts on financial inclusion can be mitigated. Our final recommendation is to walk the talk. What do we mean by this? Uh, what we really think is important here is to ensure that in the minds of all stakeholders that interact with the FATF system, that promoting financial inclusion is really key to that successful implementation of the FATF framework. How can you go around achieving this? Well, first of all, um, we think it's really important for that governance structure to acknowledge financial inclusion and its importance whenever the opportunity presents itself. So for example, at plenaries, in engagement with countries, um, in speeches that are, that are released, all would be really useful opportunities to build that culture uh, that supports financial inclusion. Second, we'd say, you know, continue that at the tables that FATF sits at, for example, the G20. Uh, could FATF really continue to, to grow the, the profile of inclusive financial integrity at those tables? And finally, we would argue, uh, well, we would call on FATF to ensure that they're really engaging with the widest set of relevant stakeholders. So ask itself, to what extent does it consider and consult digital financial service providers um, to the same extent as those more traditional sort of huge international banks who get consulted very regularly when new guidance or, or uh, standards are being considered? but to what extent are those newer providers of digital services being considered? So that concludes our recommendations. And I think what we would say overall is that yes, FATF does have some negative impacts on financial inclusion when that framework is disproportionately implemented. But fortunately, and we, we feel we have identified a number of areas where FATF could alleviate some of those negative impacts. So we would really support the work of the FATF Unintended Consequences project, which is currently ongoing, and we really look forward to their outputs to see what they come out with and, and recommend for the group. Um, I should say that if you'd like to read our papers, you can find them on the RUSI website, which is rusi.org. And uh, as I said at the beginning, just really keen to hear your feedback and uh, answer any questions that you might have. So thank you so much for taking the time this afternoon to listen to my presentation. I will stop sharing now. Thanks, uh, thanks Isabella for that presentation. Uh, before we close, uh, any uh, closing comments from uh, both of you?
just for a few seconds. Uh, I didn't have anything prepared. Um, probably just to say thank you so much for attending this afternoon. Uh, we think this is a really important topic. We really enjoyed working in this area. And I think uh, it's given us a really uh, good opportunity to maybe raise some voices outside of the core FATAF community. So uh, as I said previously, if you have any feedback on our findings, please do send them over uh, because we're keen to really hear from, from everyone on, on how they think these, uh, these objectives of balancing financial inclusion and financial crime can be, can be balanced. But yes, thank you. And thank you again to Fintelec for hosting us today. We really appreciate it. And let me just echo Isabella's comments. Uh, Sharish, thank you so much for inviting us to participate in this session today. I, I would stress that this comes at a timely moment because FATF is expressing interest in understanding better these unintended consequences. And I think that this type of dialogue is really important. And I'm so pleased that Rusi did such great work on this project, uh, leading research and dialogue on these issues and trying to help think about how can we promote both inclusion and integrity, both of which are important public policy goals and which the Rusi paper shows are quite related and interrelated. So thanks to Isabella and her team at uh, Rusi. Well, thanks, Chris, uh, and thanks, Isabella. Thank you both so much for joining us today and sharing your thoughts. Uh, participants, thank you so much for joining. I trust the session has been useful to you. To view recordings of more such past sessions, please visit fintelecture.academy, make a free registration, and keep learning. My sincere thanks again to the Asian Bankers Association, Ernest, Amador, and Make for partnering with Fintelect for this webinar and inviting uh, so many people for it. Uh, I would also like to announce that the Fintelect Asia AML CFT third annual summit, which will be held very soon from July 5th to 9th for an entire week, three hours of learning every day. Uh, ABA is also a partner at this event and we encourage all ABA members as well as non-members to register free for this event. Details are available at fintelect.com as well as the Fintelect LinkedIn page. I hope to see you all again at the Asia summit and thereafter for our next webinar with ABA in August. So thank you again and have a great day.